Three, two, one. Cool. All right, everybody. Hey, this is John Barrows with Make It Happen Mondays. I am here with the one and only Morgan Ingram. Say hi, everybody. Say hi, Morgan. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Hey, man. Thanks for joining me today. And, uh, and I appreciate you, you spending the time here because as we were kind of talking before this, and sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody, um, trying to use this uh, uh, blue jeans thing, and it's working out real good now. Um, but with that, um, I appreciate you coming on because I, like we were talking about earlier on, the premise for this conversation is this. I'm 41 years old. Right. Um, I've been in the game for a while, 20 years selling that type of stuff. And, and I've, I felt like I've done a pretty good job building my brand. Right. I'm getting to the point where it's getting to a comfortable level where it's getting out there. Right. You're what, 24 now? 24. 24. Right. So you popped on the scene real fast. And in my opinion, built your brand to the level that almost mine is at at this point. And so what I want to dig into today is, first of all, what got like I've, I've watched the interviews. I've, I've watched all your videos. So I, I'm not talking about, OK, talk me through your college and that type of stuff. I do have some clarifying questions there. Of One of the things I wanted to hit on was was early days, though, early Morgan and kind of where that drive came from. And then as we go through kind of your career here, questions, but then also kind of what does it mean moving forward here and why is brand building specifically personal brand building so important or is it and, and it comes again that's kind of my thought process right i talk about kids about training and prospecting and all this other stuff and i talk to them how, about how important brand building is but the question i ultimately want to get to is is it really for the average sales rep, all right? So, but before we get into that, um, and by the way, if people have questions, um, you know, hit me up, uh, put them on the Facebook chat uh, here. I'll try to get to them. I got a ton of questions from Morgan to myself here. So with that, Morgan, talk me through like before college, right? Like, yeah, one of the videos you I, I watched, I forget which one it was, but it said, you've always had a chip on your shoulder, right? And, and whether that was born into you or whether you got it, like people always doubted you, like, what were some of the things that you can point to early in your career that you can say, yeah, that's the reason I got my chip on my shoulder? Or was it just, or were you just born that way? Uh, I don't, I don't think anyone is born with the chip on their shoulder. I don't, I don't think that's actually, I don't think that's a possibility uh, mm -hmm. because it's all perception on how you feel like your environment is. So for me, um, I like, yeah, we talked about this before, John, but like I grew up in a normal family, right? So like there's nothing, actually nothing crazy, right? Two younger brothers, mom and dad have been together ever since I've been born. So nothing's been crazy, but the events surrounding my life is what has caused me to have a chip on my shoulder. So I'll go into that. So um, yeah. my younger brother, he goes to Harvard. So obviously yeah. that's, that's part of that as well. So a lot of people don't really think that I'm as smart as I am. And so mm -hmm. I got a lot of connotations where it'd be like, you know, if you're the older brother, no one's like, oh, hey, like you're, you know, hey, you're the older brother. But it almost seems as if I was just another brother, you know, everyone would be always be like, oh, wait, yeah, you're Miles's brother. And you're not like, this is Morgan. They never knew who I was. They always knew who my brother was. So that was that that kind of fed into it. Um, I also growing up, I never was really I never was really the best at anything. I was always just like average. And yep. I never I never really knew what that meant until I started reading <laughs> personal development, which I'll go into that in a minute. But I yeah. was always pretty much average at everything. Um, at basketball, I was never the best. Um, at video games, I never was the best. I never was the best at um, school. I never was the best at anything. So I was always average and I was over, I was always overlooked because there was always someone that at least had a perception or in the top tier that they were better. So in classes, I would be in the smart classes, but I would never be like one of the top tier students. I was just kind of there. And in basketball, you know, I, 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 I played really well, but I never was like one of the best. Right. Yeah. So because I had that connotation, because teachers, you know, always gave me that connotation of like, I never was the best. I, it kind of like over time, it kind of fueled me. And so oh, no. I've always had the chip on my shoulder because I knew that I could always be better than what I was being told, but I didn't yeah. know how to actually go out there and, and show people that I was. So um, one of the things that I, I ended up finally doing was that my mom actually gave me a book. Uh, it's called how to get your dream job by Pete Leibman. And okay. so I read this book and I literally was just like, you know, what? I don't have much to lose here. Um, no one really expects a lot out of me. 
So awesome. I'm just going to literally take everything this book says and I'm just going to do it. This guy's obviously seen success. I'm just going to, I'm just going to emulate it. And so I did it. I took every single tactic from that book. I utilized it and all of them worked. So then I was like, okay, then I found like my hack and I was like, wait, if I can just read books, no one else is doing this. Everyone else has been, is naturally talented. They're naturally good at these things. If I could take books and just started and just start doubling down on them and start executing on them, I will surpass everybody. So what I did is that the back of the book, um, on most books, they give you other books to read. So I was just fortunate and blessed. There was about 200 books in the back. And so what I did is I took that book, I took it with me, and I went to the big bookstore and I started getting like buying like five books at a time. And I legitimately was, you know, I always, this is my joke, you know, instead of chugging beers, I was chugging information from books. So like, that's all I was doing. I literally was just reading, reading, reading. And I became um, more so what I like to call a human processor. So one of the biggest gifts yeah. that I have is that I can process information at a very fast rate. And so what I would do, I would just legitimately just take books and I would just start learning. So the stuff that I know about branding, the stuff I know about marketing, the stuff I know about leadership, the stuff I know about sales, I all read it from a book. This isn't something I naturally was just born with, uh, which a lot of people think. But no, there's there's been five to six years in the making of personal development to even get to where I'm even at, um, to the fact that I can have conversations with certain individuals because I've been reading so much and I, and I put my mind there uh, where they're at. See, cause that's what struck me about you, right? Cause, cause I look at it and I, I think there's two things that you're doing that, that have, that have, um, that I've grasped onto. One is you really got into motivational speaking, right? Which is your passion, right? You talk about liberation and those type of things and, and really helping people. And I think, I think, um, you know, the, the tag of industry expert or, or thought leader is a little bit overused these days. And, um, but I think motivation, right, if you have that internal motivation and, and you can kind of put some context around it, I think it's it you can get out there and start getting people to, to buy into this. Right. Sales a little bit different. Right. Sales is you need to have some experience like you need to have some. Hey, I've done this. Like I made that yeah. cold call. I sent that email. I dealt with this objection. And what strikes me about you and to, to reinforce your comment there about the books thing it's like I wouldn't consider you an industry expert in sales and, and just let me phrase this the right way in the sense that you have all this wealth of experience to, to pull from and share those insights. Right. But where I consider you, you somebody who's who's really interesting and, and somebody to pay attention to is because you're living it and you're telling your story as you're doing it. So like you're reading something, applying it, seeing it work and then telling people about it. So you're that translator for that book that all, that all those other people, because I mean, you, what's your goal this year? 300 books a year. I read, yeah, last year I read, I didn't, I got close to 300. It was like 260. Damn. All right. Damn. See, I'm not a book reader. I'm more of an experienced guy. Like I'm a guy who like, I got to go experience stuff to, in right. order, to, like I'm an opportunity. My, my thing I've been blessed with is just an opportunistic lens. So when I can see something, I can usually size it up pretty quick. I don't, my brain doesn't work in terms of reading a book and then, and then immediately applying that. So I got to talk to people like, this is how I learn the best. Right. And so you're kind of that growth hack for other kids, in my opinion, of watching somebody who's in it day to day, who might not have that, all that experience to pull from, but can read a book from somebody who does yeah. try it out and then say, shit, this worked or this didn't. Right. Yeah. That's legitimately what I can do. So have you, uh, you seen, have you ever seen blues clues? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's so, so I am, my abilities, I can jump inside of a book visually yeah. there and pick up the experiences I need and jump out. That's okay. what I can do. So um, that's something that I learned over time. You know, my I was super fortunate because my mom always took us to the library. So yeah. I was up around books. So it wasn't unfamiliar to me to go pick up a book. Um, mm -hmm. And so that that is my extreme competitive advantage because I know that I can outread majority of people that I run into. Um, statistics say that 53% of people um, after college never pick up a book ever again. Mm -hmm. 47 47 percent of people never step into a bookstore damn so it's just like the sit the stats i'm not that bad yeah <laughs> 50 to 60 um 50 to 60 books a year that a ceo reads so i just quadrupled that or yeah i four times it for one year because i knew if if i could basically read all that information at a time in my life where I could actually process that information. Now it's this year's all execution and action. I, I just have a ton, a ton of stories and a ton of information inside of me and I can instinctively now act on that information. So that, uh, that is something that's helped me. Cause like that, 
the chip on the shoulder is always there. Um, you know, I know you. I've actually seen um, previous interview that you did on Real Sales Talk to talk about the thought leaders. Um, yeah. Gary Vee is like my guy, and the reason I like him so much it's not because it's Gary Vee. Um, it's because I resonate with him the most. Yeah. Um, he has a huge chip on my on his shoulder. I do as well. He's always been overlooked. I feel like I'm overlooked all the time, which is completely mm -hmm. fine. I'm not, I'm not angry about it. Um, I'm a minority. That also plays into it as well. Yep. And I'm super young. Oh, and yep. so it's like, I don't have like, everything's, everything's not going for me, right? So it's yep. like, I got to have something. So I have yep. that edge um, and I have that. But I think that it should not actually be a complaint because yep. I'm actually excited that I have all these things against me because that means I have to learn more. Um, yeah. that means I have to get after it every single day. That means I have to be consistent. So it almost puts me in a path of actually striving for more excellence and nothing, nothing can be given to me at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, you look at all sorts of people who are, you know, that successful and they all find that thing, whatever it is that drives them, right? And whether it's the, a perception of reality, you know, I mean, you look at Tom Brady, right? He's going to wear that 199 for the rest of his life. Like, I don't care if he's the greatest quarterback of all time. Sorry, I know it's Atlanta, my bad. But but, um, <laughs> but, um, but he's going to wear that chip on his shoulder until he dies. You know what I mean? Always being underestimated. And, and I think, you know, for me, I have a very similar story as you as far as I was pretty much average at everything all the way through high school and stuff. Now, I was born as a, you know, middle class, you know, white suburban family. So I had those benefits to me, pa parents, you know, sister, that whole thing. Um, but like, if I look at my town, right, I grew up in Bedford, Massachusetts. And at the time there was two real rich communities next to us. There was Lexington and Concord and there was Bedford. And we were pretty much the scrappy little blue collar middle, you know, nobody ever, everybody always shit on us. And that kind of played into it. And then same thing with not being great, physically gifted enough to, right. to be the baller. And, you know, I played ball too, but I was never the best ball player, but I always out hustled everybody because I knew I didn't have the physical talents to, to right. be that person, right? Cool, man. Well, I, I like it. Um, that was now getting so, well, actually, my quick question for you, with, for somebody that doesn't have your skill set as far as being able to read a book and process it and translate it that fast, what, like, what recommendations for you have, let, let me add, like, for somebody like me that doesn't read a lot, like, I read some, right? I, I usually read kind of, uh, Cliff Notes versions of a lot of stuff, and I, I, I'm a big experience, but for a 22-year-old kid out of school right now, what are some concrete recommendations that you can give to a kid that does that brain doesn't work as well as yours, but sees what you're doing and says, man, I wish I could get to that point. Like, any, any small tips right now for somebody that's not like you that doesn't have that processing power? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, one, you need to be more active in reaching out to people um, and asking them questions. So, one of the things that I learned in the book that I read is uh, informational interviews. And so what I would do, I would literally go on LinkedIn. This is this is at the time where no one actually was using LinkedIn that much. It was probably mm -hmm. back in like 2011. So it, yeah. not much was being utilized on LinkedIn. It's a completely different UI back then. But the thing that I would do is I legitimately, I felt like, okay, I'm on LinkedIn. I could pretty much reach out to anyone. So at the mm -hmm. time, I wanted to be a sports agent. So what I was doing is I was reaching out to people at Fox Sports South, uh, the NBA, the NFL, like sports teams, eight sports agents. I was just literally just going hard at agencies. I was reaching out to these people. Now, how I did that is I would legitimately go on LinkedIn and I would see if they, either they went to UGA or they were in my area. I would just send connect. Um, okay. I didn't actually send a personalized note back then. I wasn't, I wasn't there yet, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I literally just hit connect and majority of people would just connect with me and they nope. were just, right, fine. So then what I did is that from that connection, they always had an email address. So what I would do is I'd find that email address, I would literally type in informational interview, and he'd be like, hey, John, uh, so excited that you connected with me on LinkedIn. Um, I actually just wanted to talk to you for legitimately 10 to 15 minutes about your career at the NBA. Um, I'm actually super curious in it. Um, not really asking for a job or anything. I just really just wanna know more about your role and how you can help me in my career trajectory. I probably got a 90% response rate. Yep. And the, but the, here's the thing. When I met with these people, um, I always asked them, why did you accept this meeting, right? Like you could mm -hmm. maybe do meeting for 60 minutes. It always was because, because not enough people are doing it. And because you're doing it, that means you're probably going to do something a lot more special in the long run. So my advice to people is, a lot of, not a lot of people take this advice ever. I don't know why. But if you go find 10 people to talk to a week, 
if you want to go a little bit shorter, Craig Rosenberg said 10 to 15 people a month if you're currently in a job. If you do that, 10, 50, what, 10 times 12 is 120 new people you connect with. Out of those 120 people, it's probably going to be five people that legitimately help you to have a paradigm shift. So my thing is that you've got to go on LinkedIn. You've got to figure out the job titles that you want, careers that you want, people that you emulate, and you need to legitimately just hit them up through email. I mean, that was probably the most beneficial thing that I did because there's just certain things in my career right now that I know what to do and I don't have to ask much questions around because I heard it from 200 other people who are already successful. And basically I connected the dots and realized, okay, that's something that's important because 200 successful people said that. Like, obviously I can't neglect that. So that's a number, that's one thing. I think also you need to watch people that you want to be like, or you want their lifestyle. So for me, um, I love Gary Vee a ton. Like, mm -hmm. that's my guy. So I legitimately watch everything he does because it's like that lifestyle is a lifestyle that I want to live. Yep. Maybe not as aggressively, but like to that level, that's where I want to be. Um, so yeah, you don't want to the Jets? Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I guess it's like the Falcons. We never can win anything. So I guess I feel the <laughs> those, right? But yeah. um, at the end of the day, like, that's someone I emulate because, like, that's the lifestyle that I want. But yeah. if you don't like that lifestyle, you need to find someone to emulate because they're going to give you the tips of how they got there by osmosis. Yeah. You just have to watch them. You have to listen to them. Um, so those are, like, two big things that, like, you yeah. can do legitimately right after we're done with this conversation. Yeah, it actually, uh, and, and before LinkedIn, I had the same, like, I used to interview anybody who I saw that I felt was successful. And again, everybody's definition of success is different, right? So anybody I felt was successful, I would do exactly that. I'd say, hey, I, can I grab lunch 30 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is. And I actually used to come prepared with very specific questions based on what I knew about them and their background, but all in the interest of just learning how to skip a few steps, right? Because I think there's a, there's a fine line between um, you know, I, I was always taught, earn it, earn it, earn it, right? And, and so that was a beat of my mentality, but there's a fine line between earning it and, and and then skipping a few steps so that you can still earn it, but but you can jump up a little bit. Like I remember uh, I, I had the opportunity to work for Jack Welsh, like GE Jack Welsh, well, and I, I ended up, yeah, exactly, winning. He's So I worked for him and Susie for two months. Cool. And one of the things was the CEO, because it was an online MBA program, and the CEO asked me, hey, why do you want to work here? You got a, your own thriving business. You're doing your own thing. Why would you want to come down here? I'm like, well, outside the obvious, Jack, you know, Jack Welsh. I, I go, look, you ever you ever played uh, Shoots and Ladders? You know, the game Shoots and Ladders, the board game? You know how, like, when you grab a ladder, it keep, lets you st skip up a few steps? So I was like, well, kind of, I've been doing things a hard way my whole career. I've been going grinding, 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 grinding. And this represents that ladder that, that'll get me up a few steps. And, and so I can kind of reach that top goal of what mine is a little bit quicker. And he was like, that's a good analogy. I was like, yeah, because that's, and that's what I think you're talking about is like growth hacking, if you will. Like, you still have to earn it, but I think you can emulate and follow people and, and listen to their stories and say, you know what, uh, you know, there's their mistakes. You know, let me learn from their mistakes as opposed to, you know, let me, let me do this all by myself. So. Cool, man. There's legitimately no reason for you. I think it's, it, there's no reason for people to be like, I'm going to do it my way and I'm not going to listen to anyone at all. And I'm not going to look at different clues. Like, I just think that you're just, you're going to be, you're going to be in a tunnel of darkness for, for a while. And there's stuff that you could have just straight up just skipped if you just yep. listen and execute. Like, and I don't, I think it's more so like a, an, an ego of like, I did this all myself instead of being yeah. like, hey, legitimately there's someone who did what I'm about to face, like I probably should just listen so I can just evade a pitfall. Like yeah. there's no reason, like it's like driving, it's like, it's like this, like, you know, when you're driving in the car and you see like a pothole in the road, right? you know, you avoid it, right? Yeah. What most I people could. do in life though, is that they're like, oh, screw, I'm just going to keep running through potholes. Like yeah. just avoid it, like avoid yeah. the pothole. If you're still going in the same direction. There's no reason yeah. to run well, it's kind of like Waze versus regular going the route, right? It's like you I turn on Waze, even though I live here in Boston, I know the city of Boston like the back of my hand. I still try to light up Waze because it helps me get around the traffic, right? Exactly. So it's the same thing. So cool, man. Well, let's uh, let's keep going here. Like, you know, you, so your background, right? So you, you kind of grew up in that. You got a little bit of a chip on your shoulder because the average piece of it. Then you hit college, you do your sports management and finance, you know, dual, right? Because that's, you know, most of us get into sales. We get something that's kind of like, what the fuck? I, I did sports management too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's, it's kind of like you do, it, you do whatever you think you're supposed to do, yeah. but it, I always find it insane. At 16, 17, 18 years old, there's, you're supposed to know exactly what you're supposed to do for the rest of your life. So, again, I, I'm following Gary on this one as far as I think college is, 
I think it's a social education, not an actual education. Right. Um, so, but you know, so then, and then you went to, you had this professor who taught entrepreneurship and kind of got you hooked on that. And then you went to this Atlantic tech village and then some judge, what was this judge t t told you to go talk to Terminus? No, so it wasn't a judge. So, so this is what happened. So I met the person of entrepreneurship. Yeah. I, I just learned what the word entrepreneurship was when I was like 22 years old. So legitimately for my whole life, I thought that like, rich and famous people just popped out of nowhere and you just kind nice. of got like chosen. So I was like, dang, I just didn't get chosen. Like, I guess it is what it is, right? I never did, I did, never did enough research for myself um, mm -hmm. to really figure that out. Like I had the mindset and the personal development rolling, but it hadn't clicked while there's like an actual process behind this all. Um, so I, I saw, I had that class. My thought process changed a lot. My friend who was really big in entrepreneurship was like, dude, you need to start something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what am I going to start? Like, what, like, I don't know how to build anything. I don't know what to do, but I knew I had the energy to do something. So I actually, what happened is I started a company. Um, I was a hosting, gaming company, right? hosting, hosting video game tournaments on college campuses. Yep. Um, I ran that. It was profitable. Um, but at the end of the day, I was running a business with college people. So yep. like, it just didn't work. Right. And like, I didn't have like, and the crazy thing is like, there was no funding. There was no mentor. There was no advisory board. Like there was nothing. It was just me just legitimately just reading and figuring it out. Um, probably a mistake at the end of the day, but like I learned a ton just from That's the best way to do it, man. Yeah. I just went and just did it, right? I just didn't care. But I mean, I built a partnership program. I got sponsors. Like I was, we were closing deals. Like it, it happened, right? Like I legitimately was moving pieces, which it was really fun. But yeah. after it didn't work, I was like, okay, like, I don't have any money because I spent it on the company. My graduation yeah. money's gone. What the heck do I do? Like, I can't just start something else. Like, I don't know what to do. I've never been here before. So I met, I went to the, because I was actually wanted to be um, a public speaker. I was like, this is something I want to do long term. I think I could legitimately just make money in a turnaround. Found out that, like, you got to build your brand for a while. You can't just show up on the scene and request 5K for a speech. Like, who are you, right, to do that? Like, where's your value? So I just yeah. didn't understand that yet. Learning pieces. But I went to the, because I just, I was like, I have to learn. And because I, at this point, I legitimately just, I have no, I have no cares for things. I'll just do yeah. them. Yep. To the National Speakers Association. I met okay. someone, Jeff Sheehan. He liked what I was doing with Periscope. And he told me about Terminus. And then I was like, okay, let me consider it. Cause I was still trying to figure out what I do in my life. And then in January, I cold called Tony, the, the, the director of sales at the time, now VP of sales. And I was like, this is the reasons why I want to work at Terminus. This is why I want this job. And that that's how I ended up getting it. Okay, so because that was going to be my question. Now, let me back up a little bit. When you, because I, when, when I was listening to some of your interviews, you said when you did that, it was a co collegiate gaming at LAN. Uh, that yes, was the company, yes. right? So yes. that you said that people started to ask you to come and talk to them just because they were like, man, I love what you're doing here. So did you purposely, like, when did you catch the bug for public speaking? I guess is my question. Is this like, was it because when you were doing this, this, this company and people started bringing you in, you started talking to people or was it a conscious thing where, you know what? I like talking. Let me go out and search for it. Uh, so, so perspective. So when I first saw someone speak, I hated it. I was like, this is a joke. This guy's no idea who he's talking about. I don't ever want to be a speaker. Like, I hope this is something I never, cause these guys are jokes, right? Yep. So, it's interesting because I never like I took a public speaking class. I got an A because I was just naturally good at it. And someone was yep. like, "You could be really good at it." I was like, "I legitimately do not care. Like, yep. let me get my A. Let me move on." Um, so it all changed when I actually did it. So yep. I did get asked to go speak to a group of students about starting a company and like doing your process. And then, you know, once I started speaking, I realized that like, wait, I'm really good at this. And you don't also, have like, to suck. <laughs> People you don't are, have to be one of those shit bags, right? Yeah, and like people are really attentive, and I'm actually helping these people. Because yeah. um, after they were asking me questions, and I was like, and I was actually diving into them, and they were like, no one ever like sticks around and like actually answers questions. And I was like, that's what you're supposed to do. Like, why would I leave? Like, I wouldn't want that, you know. So mm -hmm. once I realized that, I was like, this is this is it. Like, this is why I'm here. I'm legitimately here to give value to be in a public spotlight, not because I, I've always, I mean, yeah, I guess at some level everyone wants attention, but also sure. because I knew I, I was naturally good at this. Like this was a God given talent. So I was like, okay, I can't be selfish with this. I need to amplify. So like, what do I need to do next? So once, after I did that first speech, I was like, this is it. Like I'm legitimately good at this. And so 
um, as I continue to do things and I continue to do speeches, I realize that like, yeah, this is it. Like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I have enough fire to give it to someone else. And also like, I wanted to do it from a spotlight of good um, and not just selfishness. Cause there's, there's just a lot of, there's just a lot of people out there who are speakers and that that's all like they do their speech and then they dip, you know, like, I don't ever want to be that person. Like I want to surpass everyone else who's on that level and then also do it better than them on a level that like, I actually care about my audience. Um, Cause that's something that frustrated me seeing other speakers is that they never cared about their audience. They just showed up for the money and they left. And I was like, that's kind of lame. So, well, so that's not how I got that perception. Yeah, it's kind of the same in training, man. Like I always know, like I always said, when I got into training, I'm like, hell no, when I got the opportunity. I'm like, God, no. And they're like, why not? I'm like, I hate trainers. And they're like, why? I'm like, because every trainer, sales trainers, every trainer I had to come up against up at that point in my life was either a failed sales professional or a professional presenter. You know, and it was the person that just stood up there and regurgitated a slide deck and never got any insights or never practiced what they preached, right? In the sense that, like, if you haven't sold anything, if you haven't sold anything ever, I can't hear you. If you haven't sold anything in the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years, like, I'm going to have a hard time listening to you as well. Yeah. And so I had the same thing with you. It's like I've always said as a trainer, I was like, you know, I'm never going to be that guy who's like, hey, 20 years ago, that's why I always consider myself, I'm a sales guy that happened to be all right delivering some content that I feel very passionate about and that makes all the difference in the world and sticking around for those q a and actually doing stuff like that because that's where the real meat is it's not in the slide deck right yeah yeah cool man hey um so you started at terminus right so you co-called your the, now that what was tony tony yeah yeah so you co-called tony and which first of all recommendation for reps out there looking for jobs don't just submit your resume do that okay like do your homework just like you would prospect into an account prospect into a company that you believe in and um but then like what was when you first came on board with tony right how did you guys align expectations or because because a, a key to a lot of reps getting in and staying into sales is that first manager that that gives them like the the, the guidelines and, and helps them put them in a position to be successful. What were some of the things early on that Tony did and, and you did to kind of say, hey, look, I'm, I'm here, I'm brand new. You know what I mean? Like, I think sales is cool, like this is whatever. But, but what were some of the things early on that you all did to, to make sure that those expectations were aligned and you were on the right path? And what did he do? Yeah, so first 90 days, um, so Lucas is the director of sales development and Tony was the director of sales. So I just told them, hey, look, um, legitimately when I told people I wanted to go into tech, everyone thought I was going insane. They were like, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. And I was like, look, I, this is where I need to go. I just, I had the instinct, I had the hunch. Um, yep. So I took, uh, every single week, I had 30 to 45 minutes uh, of cold calling with Tony. And I said, legitimately, I want you to be like the hardest prospect I've ever called. I want you to be cold. I want you to be super difficult. Um, cool. A lot of people don't ask for it. If you, but the thing is like, if you can do it when it's super difficult, is you're going to do it when it's easy. Like just make yep. this comments. You just yep. need to ask for right now like, don't wait to like when you get a difficult situation and be like oh i wish i would have trained in difficulty so like that's how i did mm -hmm. with tony and then lucas every single call every single email um and every single uh check my voicemails as well for like 90 days straight and i said like if it's like little nitpicky stuff i want you to like just tear into me like i just treat it as like not to be sensitive of like when you're getting you know getting picked yeah. apart and I don't like getting picked apart because I like I like thing I like knowing what I'm doing is right, but at the same time I knew it's important because it's like if I don't get critiqued along the way, then like that's kind of like that's not going to be helpful. So yes. expectations I set them super high. I told them to legitimately just like just ride me hard, like literally just get on me, um, so yes. I can be the best. You know, um, you can't make a masterpiece unless you're chiseled. So at the end of the day, like that's I needed that. I needed to get chiseled by the people that obviously have done it. I I know a lot of things, but I didn't know anything about tech and sales, so I can't come up with the audacity that like they can't teach me anything because obviously they're in those they're obviously in those positions for a reason. So I needed to listen. So that's that's kind of how I came into the role. I love it. And so again, just takeaways from this because I'm always trying to figure. You know, my audience is I, like I love takeaways and nuggets. Is and I say the same thing. If you want to be your manager's, if you want to go to the top of a manager's list proactively ask for feedback you know what i mean yeah. and i think you're spot on i don't think i think most reps just sit back and say tell me what to do and they yeah. go about their days where i tell reps hey at nine o'clock at night cold call your manager leave them a voicemail come in the next day and say hey would you have responded to that like you know hey sit down and listen to me and be be 
be harsh, right? Be like, be, it's kind of like playing ball. I always say like, you don't just jump out onto a court, right? Right. And just start playing a game. Like you got to warm up a little bit. You got to stretch out. You got to take a few shots. And that's what role play. That's what practice is, is to get you. So that the game time you're ready. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of just to your, you know, I think the takeaway for that for me is just, you know, for all the reps out there is just make sure you go to your managers and say, Hey, I want that feedback. Can I proactively outside of our weekly management, you know, team meetings or stuff like that. Can we grab lunch once a week or something, or could you sit in on the call blitz and specifically listen to me or something like that? Right. I love it, man. Uh, then Ralph, my boy, Ralph, you got 10, you got 10 more minutes. Yeah. yeah 10 more minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so then my boy Ralph is the one like you, so you're in SDR, you're like kicking it. You're like, all right, I like this. I'm catching the groove. I'm listening to all of these people. I'm putting this stuff together. I mean, by the way, I'm going to recommend everybody go check out SDR Chronicles. What number are you on? 65 now? 659. Just did 59, yeah. so it'll be 60. Yeah, so I, I didn't have enough chance to watch all of them, but but, but okay. I saw some of the highlights, right? Which is you know go, you know goal setting and structure and, and structure your time. There's a question that came in on Facebook Live here about how to how to advice to advice providing them for prioritizing their time. We'll get to that if we have some time here, but go watch SDL Chronicles because it's all up there on Morgan stuff. Um, so Ralph told you what brought that conversation off with Ralph? Because you were like, all right, I, I like sales. I'm a, I like motivational speaking. Uh, I want to start doing something. We're, talk to me about that conversation with Ralph that kind of puts you on the, hey, let me start a YouTube channel here. Um, Yeah, I'm super, I'm just super advantageous. I'm super hungry. Um, yep. I'm not willing to just sit back and, and wait for things. That's just not who I am. So I read a blog post and I literally just saw, I read it through because I was, before I started my role, I was just reading a ton of stuff. I was yep. like, I'm going to be very prepared. I'm not going to come in blinded. Uh, so I saw the thing, getting out of obscurity um an sdr should create a youtube channel and i was like that's it that's exactly what i do i've already been creating videos i've already done other stuff like this will be this will not be hard for me so yeah. i literally found him on twitter i sent him a video i was like hey look i'm morgan ingram uh you have no idea who i am uh but i'm gonna create this youtube channel and watch out that's legitimately how that conversation went with him he responded nice. and he went okay awesome see you soon i saw him at rainmaker i hadn't made any videos yet i was two months in the role he was like, where are the videos? I was like, just wait. Like, I want to learn more before I actually do it. I don't want to just come up to see and be like, hey, this is Morgan, and you have I have no experience or know anything. Yeah, yeah. So then, then it was like three months later I started it. So that's kind of how that process cool. went. All right, so just get going with it. But have something to offer there, right? I like it. Um, so now you've kind of moved into this perception reality world of, you know, I think a lot of people do, and again, this is kind of the loose term of thought leadership here, right? I, I think it gets overplayed quite a bit. And, you know, the conversation with Real Sales Talk was, you know, I don't think you're a thought leader. If you say, if you tell everybody you're a thought leader, you're probably not a thought leader. Like, it's kind of like you, if you tell everybody you're an entrepreneur, you're probably not an entrepreneur. So, so, but you've moved into this world where like it or not, you know, people, I think with whatever their definition is, look at you and say, hey, this is a thought leader, at least in the SDR world, right? So help me understand what, what your definition is of, of, of what a thought leader is and why it's important to, for, for an individual. This is where I want to get into the conversation of why it's important for that 22, 23 year old or that 55 year old, you know what I mean? Like, or, or the 41 year old, why is it important uh, to move in that direction? So first definition of what you see it as and second of why is it important? Yeah. So first of all, yeah. If you check every single one of my content, all my videos, go check every single one. I never mentioned myself as a thought leader. No. Never mentioned myself as an expert. I never, I never, even, I don't think I've even mentioned myself as an influencer. No. I don't mention them at all. So that's first thing. Don't mention yourself as that. You've already lost. Yeah. <laughs> like, Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we no, like I've never said it, but to your point, there are tons of people who would say that I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, and they're credible sources. It's not like my mom and dad and like my best <laughs> friends, you know, like, oh, yeah. you're in it. No, it's like legitimate people, like mm -hmm. legit stuff, like legit. So it's like, that's when I knew, okay, like I'm obviously doing the right thing. I'm obviously providing the right value in the marketplace. Um, yep. That's when I knew that I was, uh, I guess, a thought leader or whatever the heck you want to call it. Now, yep. for me, like what that means is that the stuff that you're doing is, is influencing people and they're and they're actually getting your content and they're actually utilizing it and they're actually seeing results. Cool. That's that's what the thought leader means to me is that like I'm providing you real thoughts from my head and I'm and it's leading you to take the right action and you're actually listening to it. 
do you have to be do you have to be a practitioner and and when i say that you you you're you're blessed with the ability to be able to read a book and then kind of crunch that down and say cool so you could easily get away with standing up here and effectively regurgitating what other people say and be considered a thought leader do you think it's necessary for somebody to go live it before they can really be actually considered at that level okay so I so the earlier part is what I used to do. I'll yep. be straight up 100% honest yep. on that. Like I would take books and I would tell them, I would say, hey, like this is how I feel, and I would I have enough energy and personality to make you believe like that's could be actually for me, right? Like sure. the thing is like that's how that's how I was processing information at the time because like I was excited about the information. I yep. was only 21, yeah, 21 when I made my first video, and I legitimately would just take books and I would say, hey, this is what I learned in this book. This is how it applies in my life hopefully it can apply to you. So like I was trying to do it from a place of like me learning the book, but also wanted to share it because no one else was reading these books. And I was like, I just feel like I was the only one. So I was like, all right, if I put it out here, maybe people will actually either start reading these books or they can get this information and utilize it in their life. Now, let me ask a quick question. Quick question. Was that on the motivational stuff? It was just across, yeah, motivational stuff. It was just across the board. Okay. I was just doing, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, a lot, uh, some of the motivational stuff came from experiences of like, hey, don't do this because I did it, and like you should do this. But yep. some of it came from books, and I was just kind of amplifying that message and saying it in my own way. But it, yeah, yeah. Came from the book, right. So my thing is that like this type of leadership that I have now, or this perception, or this this kind of the transition is because I'm a practitioner. I'm, I've actually done the stuff that I've talked about and I legitimately am currently still doing the stuff that I'm talking about. So it holds more validity and it holds more weight. And also if you ask me a question about sales development or, or leadership at this point, I'm able to answer that question and I don't need to go look at my notes and be like, Oh, great question. Let me go check at column number three. Like, no, that's dumb. Like that makes no sense. Like the thing is that like, I think you could really see if you're a really true thought leader influencer is when you ask me a question on the topic that I'm talking about, I can answer it with, with, without a blink of my eye. That's what actually brings real true influence. That's why on every single podcast, I don't ask for the questions. If they send me questions, I don't read them because if I come on your podcast and I don't know what I'm talking about, then I should be exposed. I hear you. I'm the same way, man. I don't like scripted. Don't give me the questions. Just give me the, give me, don't give me the questions beforehand. Let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I like it. Give me some context, obviously. Um, but um, cool, man. Uh, just a couple more. You're at, going back to average SDR, right? So your average SDR that doesn't have the drive, that doesn't have that chip on their shoulder, that's sitting there making those calls, that doesn't even know if sales is the right job for them. You know what I mean? Like I got a cousin right now who got into sales. I don't want to say the company, but you know, he got. He's like, I don't know about this. I told him his life was going to suck for the first year or two. Uh, specifically based on a company he was working for. But but my point is, is like, if you're listening to this right now, I got this whole spiel about death of the average sales rep, about how artificial intelligence is going to start, start to take over and how our personal brands are going to really matter moving forward. It is it important for the average SDR to, to, to start kind of moving in that direction, at least sharing, you know, information and, and what should they be doing right now to put themselves in a position so that in the future, things are a lot easier for them? Uh, this, this is actually a good question. And my answer to this is always the same. It depends on what you're trying to do. Yep. If you're just trying to be, if you're just a nine to fiver, you're just trying to get by, you're trying to get an AE role eventually, then no, don't build a personal brand. Don't waste your time. Right. But if you're really trying to, the best and you're trying to crush it and you're trying to kill quota then you should because at this day and age like if no one knows what you're doing like on a digital level um it's just going to take you longer to build your brand i'm not saying that like you don't have to like i'm not saying that like, if you don't do this you're done for i'm just saying that like just clearly by the the people's journey and just i could even say for myself like I wouldn't be in the position I was in if I didn't do the SR Chronicles or didn't build a brand. Like yeah, I would yeah. still be, do, I wouldn't even be close to even the trajectory of where I'm going to go or where I want to be. I just wouldn't be close. So it yeah. all depends on like you as a person. Like, do you, like, do you have the drive to actually do this? Like, it's not that like I sit at work all day and videos, right? That, that's not the case. I'm just saying that like between nine to five, outside of that, I'm doing more. Like on Saturdays, I would, I'd be sitting in, in the office for four to five hours making videos, editing those yep. videos, preparing for content, sending out emails. But like, the thing is that like, 
is that individual, are you ready to take that on? Because I think, I think a lot of people just think it's like, it take, it's easy like to just show up and make a video or it's easy to, just, yeah. to set up a schedule of posts. Like it's not easy. So like right. you just have to realize that like, okay, like this is what I want to do. And you have to have a true why or reason behind it. If you just want to have a personal brand so people can listen to you, you're not going to win. Yeah. That, which actually brings me kind of one of, one of my last questions is about goal setting, right? Cause I agree with you. I think everything starts with, your personal goals, not company goals, that type of stuff, but your personal goals, like where, you know, what kind of, what kind of lifestyle you want to have, what, what do you envision yourself and then how much money or what do you need to do to get there? Right. And then back that into daily stuff. Let me ask right. you, how far out do you push your goals? Like for you, you know, what is that big hairy goal for you and, and how far is it out there for you? So it's actually it's actually quite interesting. So I uh, I believe in an over an overarching goal that always pushes you every single day and you can't run away from. Okay. So not like the goal of like oh cool let me get promoted because then when you get promoted then what right or the goal right. of like I want to be the director of sales you get that goal then what you have to reassess right. everything right. in your life. So my thing is that like I want to be the best motivator of all time like okay. all time legendary that's it so with that goal there's a lot of things that i have to do on a daily basis to make sure like that stands true um mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of things a lot of daily habits that i have to take um and then also that's the big overarching goal and then for my for every single year i do it by i do goals by quarters okay. so i have q1 goals q2 goals q3 goals q4 goals i make them right before the quarter so i made my goals on Friday, Saturday, I kind of combine those days to do that. And then yep. based on if I hit the Q1 goals, then cross them out. I've got to hit it. And if I didn't hit the Q1 goals, then they would move into Q2. If the Q1 goals that went over to Q2 were not hit in Q2, then I need to reassess that goal and probably make it a little bit smaller and not be as aggressive. So that's how I do goals. And ever since I started doing it um, for the past two years, I've, I've, I've hit the majority of them because it just helps me stay focused. Yeah, and that's like the whole smart goal setting, right? Specific, measurable, yeah, yeah, attainable, yeah. realistic, and timely. Um, and I think like think and grow rich. You, I'm sure you've read that one, right? That that's all yeah, about goal yeah. setting and being there. So cool, man. Well, look, I so so let me ask you. So best motivator of all time. Um, do you have a timeline on that one? It's all time. It's really all time for me. Like it's the goal that I strive for every single day. But um, I mean, do you like do you say you know what? By the time I'm 40 years old, I want to have like Tony Robbins type audiences, or or is it more oh, just? Oh yeah, yeah, that that's what you mean. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, by by 40, I just think the the influence will be a lot higher than it already is now. Oh I mean, sure. It's, gonna, it's definitely building in a nice trajectory. But the biggest thing that I had to take a self awareness and a self look on was that the fact that like the stuff that I'm talking about, I actually need to be doing it. Um, and it started pissing me off because a lot of millennials and a lot of people like around my age were talking about stuff that they did not do. Um, and when I met them in real life, they were jokes. So like, I was like, I don't want to be a joke. So I was like, I need to legitimately find stuff that like I'm actually doing on a day to day basis. That's actually real. And so when you ask me a question about it, like I know the answer to it and it's, and it comes from an actual genuine place and not because so-and-so told me this is how it works or because i made it up in my head or like, I actually don't know at all. And it just sounds good across yeah. the internet. Um, I'm not, I don't want to be exposed for anything and I actually want to build like real life stuff. So yes. Yeah, so on a motivator level, that's where I want to be at. I think that people get confused um, on the background of Tony Robbins and Gary Vaynerchuk and these people like Tony Robbins legitimately goes into C level suites, millionaires and billionaires and actually like changes their paradigms and actually increases their business. On yeah. bottom line, it's not just a motivation. Speaker. No, like, he actually doesn't even consider it. Like if you ask him, he doesn't, doesn't consider he himself doesn't. a motivational speaker. He legitimately does like real stuff, right? People yeah. say like Gary legitimately runs a business, right? So yeah. it's like, for me, it's like, I want to have practicality around what I do. And yes, that's the level that I want to reach because I want to show people like, you don't need all these fancy things to do well. Like I, I on purpose have done all my chronicles on my MacBook Air Mm -hmm. um, and I got a studio just so there's no excuses for anybody, right? right? To like, oh, I don't have this. I don't have a mic. It's like, no, nah, I have this MacBook Air and... Uh, you, know, <laughs> you see my home office? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm, like, I'm same ghetto style, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, 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 I put in the work and, I, and the content and the grind is what got me here. Yeah. It wasn't a fancy studio or something fancy that got me here. It's legitimately, I figured out how to edit my videos. I figured out how to film my videos. I made up my own content. 
I reached out to the people that I wanted to be on the show. If they didn't, cool. If they did, great. That's legitimately how I built it. So um, I stand by that because it's real. Like, and I want that realness of what I built so that when someone asks me a question, I'm like, how do you, how do, you do this? I can legitimately say, hey, look, like, I took what I had and I maximized it. Yep. Everything evolves, nothing decreases. Love it. All right, man. I, yeah, cause I, cause that's kind of, people ask me, John, what's the secret to success? And <laughs> my answer is always the same. It's like, it's working your ass off and, and doing it right. Cause I'm, I always said, I'm not the smartest cat out there. You know what I mean? I, I, I did okay in school, whatever, but, but I'll, I'll outwork you. And that's why I like Gary, right? Gary's like, his biggest fear is that everybody who's watching his stuff isn't actually doing anything. They're just watching it. And it's like, get out there and do it, right? So cool, right. man. Well, I appreciate the time here. You had any, any kind of parting, you know, tell people where to find you uh, and any parting gifts for the audience here? Okay, so where to find me? At Morgan J. Ingram on Twitter, Morgan J. Ingram on LinkedIn, the YouTube channel, SDR Chronicles, where I talk about my sales development journey, how I, you know, went from SDR to SDR manager in a year, um, and basically just telling you tactics and skills that, like, legitimately I've, I've used on the phone and through email to, to schedule new net opportunities for a uh, close business. So it's got a lot of great tips there. That's how you reach me. I answer everything. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any more questions based on this interview. Um, the last, the last tip is that like at the end of the day, like just focus in on the stuff that you can control and don't focus on the stuff that you can't control. So if you are in a spot that like may not be the best spot, you, you can't always control your effort. You can't always control the resources you can listen to and you can always control um, how much output you put every single day. Um, so that was one of the best things that I, out of every book that I've read is that control what you can control. Like you can control yourself going to the gym. You can control how many people you, you reach out to, how much effort you want to put into building a YouTube channel, your brand, your business. Uh, and once you realize that everything else becomes kind of irrelevant and you realize that like I need to just, put in the work or I need to actually do this every single day. Um, and then you'll just start getting the results. I love it, man. You, you, you like this, my daughter, she's six years old. And, uh, and I said, look, you know, cause she, like she was affected even by the, uh, the, um, election and all this other stuff. And she was getting all upset. I'm like, sweetheart, let's just focus on eat effort, attitude and con effort, attitude and how we treat people. Those right. are the things that you can control. You control what you can control. You can't control outside factors. You can control your effort. You can control your attitude. Right. You can control how you treat people. So 100%. awesome stuff, man. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it here. I'd love to chat just for two seconds, but I'm gonna end it here. Um, really appreciate the time, man. Uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to listening to more of what you got out there. All right. 100%. Had a great time. Cool. Thanks, brother. All right. I'm stopping.